one. I'm going to uh, call the uh, the meeting to order. Any public comments? Not seeing any, we'll move to the minutes. Has everybody had a chance to review the minutes? I move to accept. We have a second. Usually that's me, but I can't do that. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Moving on. Uh, it looks Very like uh, we have Mr. Uh, Walthrop leading off uh, today. That's right. Chris? Thank you very much. Go right ahead. Get it. Uh, everybody can hear me? Yep. We can. All right, excellent. So, uh, so the first uh, 1A, the USI update, property casualty risk management activities. This is, um, you know that I try to give a monthly update and, and obviously last meeting, we covered a lot of ground, a little bit of a catch up, knowing that uh, the committee does not meet over the summertime. But uh, just in terms of where, where we are on the property casualty side, uh, first there was, a, there was a, a claim review session last month that I mentioned and kudos to Kerma uh, because there's a lot of work that the adjusters uh, have to do to be able to report on the status of, you know, a number of open, you know, liability and workers' comp claims, but also it's a good opportunity for the town and the school district to share the latest status with what they know, uh, especially with perhaps injured employees um, and their their return back to the workplace. And then the adjusters at Kerma can do the same thing. And it really helps to refine strategy. It refines the case reserves um, for, for accuracy. And it really works to help the employees get back promptly, you know, uh, as, as medically reasonably as possible. Um, but so that happened, that's it. And it's important to understand the sequence. The next, uh, we are about ready to jump into um, helping first Matt, who's, who's on this session, and starts his budget process. I'm sure that's starting to crank up. But then it also transitions over to the town with uh, Mike O'Neill. So when we're talking about the budget process, it's looking at July 1st, 21 to 22, and helping to forecast not just where insurance premiums might be, but even before that, connecting to marketplace conditions, looking at the types of exposures, the types of projects that the town and the school district will have this coming year, and even helping with what we call cost of risk. So we take a look and say, okay, based on what we know today, what do we project premiums might be based on exposures, based on losses, but also what about retentions? What about the possibility of deductibles being incurred in this coming year? So the whole idea is to be as accurate as possible. Um, and granted, we know that here we are in the middle of October, right? There's a lot of time between now and July 1st. So the idea is to start early, help Matt, help Mike, and uh, you know, work together with Ashley, work together with, with, with other people. And the whole idea is to continue to refine the estimates you know, prior to when the town formally presents and adopts their budget overall. Uh, but we do spend a lot of time on that because we know, you know, especially this year, uh, the municipalities are in kind of a critical mode where with the coronavirus, with in some cases less revenues coming in and a lot of uncertainty, now's the time to really push it. So, so I, I haven't in the past mentioned a budget in October, but if there was any year to mention it and say, hey, this is serious, this is that year. Okay. Any questions about that? Hi, this is Frank. Hey, Frank. Hey, Frank. Frank. Don't even ask. Yeah, we won't. We, we're, we're, we're moving along. I, I performed a, uh, a minor coup, but now you can take back over. So we're, we're... No, I, I, thought you, I thought you enacted the 25th Amendment. <laughs> I'm not sure that's in the... Uh, in the Wethersfield bylaws, and something we, we, we um, could we could make it. Uh, but Chris is uh, Chris Walthrop is is into his yeah. uh, his deal. So go ahead, Chris. 
All right, thanks. And I know it's being recorded. So Frank, um, you know, you can have some popcorn at a later date to uh, watch and listen. Uh, I'll finish so, my beer now. There you go. So uh, we're still on uh, the reports from agents of record, Frank. So it's 1A yeah. that I'm on. I'm okay. finishing, that, finishing that part up. So the um, just in terms of other types of activities, uh, you might recall last year we talked about almost like a, a just a, a risk calendar. Some of the activities that as we go month to month, we take a look at, you know, USI very shortly and uh, you have some other providers that will do it. We like to provide some educational material to help you know, with awareness with situations that could lead to claims like slip trip fall with winter weather. Um, we don't believe the coronavirus will actually reduce the icing conditions, but we shall see. Um, so, so that's one, but, but also um, just within the last week, I know Mike O'Neill had reached out and uh, you know, there was some training activities that uh, he was uh, and, his, and his colleagues were looking to do. Mike, any, any comments on that? Uh, no, just, you know, we're kind of continuing to develop our risk management here and just looking for any, any opportunities that we have to, to get some training in. Sounds good. All right, so any and questions? Mike and Chris, I'm sorry, this is Ashley. Obviously, anything that PERMA can do on our end to complement and assist with training, you know, just let us know, reach out to me, reach out to your risk management consultant, and we're happy to work in tandem. Did, uh, I think I just saw that Ian listed on a new training, with, that was the cybersecurity, right, Ashley? Uh, I believe that is correct. Yeah, Ian Havens is doing that one. Yeah, so he'd be our contact, right? You know, we actually are sort of committing our risk management folks by their strengths. So, for example, Steve Pendle is a retired fire chief. So he handles a lot of the fire and emergency training and things like that. So it really depends. But Ian is definitely probably your main contact to go to on risk management. Good. And thanks, Ashley, for... Um for um, commenting on that. As a matter of fact, when Mike asked the question, I actually mentioned Ian Haven's name. <laughs> so it was perfect timing for that. So thank you. And uh, Yeah, you're in great hands with him. So moving on to letter B, this uh, USI steer resource. Um, what that refers to is USI, it's almost like a website in a website. And, and you probably have seen this. There are quite a few different service providers uh, but you know some person inside usi cleverly you know came up with this acronym s-t-e-e-r which is technically steer through epidemic and economic recovery we're not in an epidemic this is a pandemic but they had to come up with something um, but what it is if in in i don't know that we'll share you know the screen right now but each one of you if you go on literally usi.com, at the very top of that website, it says COVID-19 Updates and Client Resource Center. The reason that I'm bringing it up right now is that you know it feels like we have opposing forces. In some cases, you read about businesses and municipalities who are opening up more and more. In fact, earlier this week, you know, we had two different municipal clients say, hey, would you like to come up to town hall? We can have our meeting, like later this month. We have a number of others that say we're still operating virtually. And yet the infection rates continue to go up. You saw the Hartford Current headline this morning, positivity rates up, you know. Uh, so these are things we need to be careful about. But this, Website in a website, when you go to it, there are some drop down menus with different types of topics. One of them gets into what we call response and risk mitigation. So we have sample templates on telecommuting policies and procedures, for instance, which was something that we had a number of our municipal clients ask about, believe it or not, as you would expect, last March and early April. There are cyber updates. There are risk management guidebooks that we have. 
And um, so that's that area. Um, we have reopening guidelines. Under the property casualty side, there's a tab you'll see for that if you wanna go on it. But there are a number of different things to talk about reopening strategies. Um, some have to do with construction project re restart strategies. Uh, another one gets into repurposing. Are you ready for this? So this draws on all industries that USI works with. One of them gets into repurposing of existing or closed senior care facilities. It sounds like that might be a little bit of a stretch to apply to the town or the school district, but is it possible that you may have a facility that needs to be repurposed in any way as we make our way through the winter time and let's say infection rates go through the roof. So, that's another example. Um, there's some information about workers' comp rules changing a little bit in certain areas. Um, and then, uh, in, you know, I don't know, Mr. Monroe, I know you're on mute right now, but there's a whole segment also on employee benefits. And that is something that if you go through it, you'll see month to month new content being added right into this month. Chris, any, any comments on that side? Yeah, no, it's pretty expansive. You know, it seems like every week there's more content added to the um, portal that Chris and I have access to. Um, what I would in essence say is if, if there's a particular thing that you want us to run down, chances are pretty good it's there in a deliverable format. So yeah, no, the company's done a very nice job of getting that stuff uh, out there, if you will. Yeah, thanks. And, and you know, because we work uh, also with, you know, personal insurance clients. So we have this division called personal risk. There's even a, a little drop down menu there that goes into personal cyber risk, a cyber checklist, carrier responses to COVID-19, and even, you know, the impact on personal insurance related to COVID-19. So it's, a, it's, it's designed to help our clients. It will absolutely be redundant <laughs> with a lot of other resources that you have whether it be from other types of consultants, um, you know, obviously very aware, and I'll, and I'll, in a second, I'm sure Ashley will share, Kerma has a, an enormous amount of information that complements what we have, and in some ways is obviously more expansive in certain specific areas too. Um, but again, we don't know right now, obviously what's going to happen in November, December, January. Uh, you know, I think that there's, there's in some ways, if you watch 60 Minutes last Sunday, there's, a, there's almost like a little bit of a shift instead of being a full vaccine, are there some therapeutic type of approaches um, that might be you know, more reasonable in play here as we uh, try to combat COVID-19. So um, I just wanted to point that out. We're on call for our clients. You may have situations that come up on a weekend and there's a need to talk. So um, I just wanted to mention that. Um, I'll stop here and uh, answer any questions you have, but also give Ashley if you have enough, if you want to, because I know Kerma has a host of information um, in a different medium on the website, through LinkedIn, a lot of different things too. Yeah, thank you, Chris. Um, we, we do have our own COVID website also that has a lot of risk management resources, employee safety, um, you know, as offices start to reopen for schools also. But, you know, like Chris said, it's, it's really changing from day to day, hour to hour. So, you know, we're, we're just trying to keep up and give everyone the resources that we have at this moment. Um, after this session, I will forward the link and a couple of the documents that our clients have given, you know, some, some praise to. They said, yeah, this is, this is pretty effective. So we'll get that out to the group so you can see it. But uh, we encourage you to look at that. And uh, what questions can I uh, answer at this point? I, here, let me, am I off? Oh, okay. Um, I, I was reading an article, probably goes back a month ago, and I, I don't have, I, some of the facts aren't, well, I won't say. Um, there was a lawsuit that was settled by one of the, um, by a city, down, I think it was Louisville or something, regarding the um, shooting by, a, by, the, by their police. And one of the things that was stated in the article was that um, this was a whole, 
this raised the benchmark in terms of settlements for cases moving forward. And I'm just wondering, is that going to affect our, um, I'm trying to think of what the policy is, but the policy um, regarding, you know, any, something that our police officers do? So, so to, to answer that, Tom, um, you know, a lot of times we do get questions um, that there's been some event that takes place or multiple events, or there's a settlement or damages awarded uh, for any, it could be a number of different types of claims. Uh, for instance, there are auto accidents that take place where uh, the question comes up if settlements and jury awards, <clears throat> excuse me, for, social, for um, auto accidents where there's an at fault party that those awards go up because of what we call social inflation, will that have a direct impact right here in our state? And the way that I would answer that would be, there's, there's especially today, awareness by so many different people about the legal climate and the social climate around the country in each state. We don't know just yet how that situation, that direct situation could have an impact here in Connecticut. Um, each state can have different statutes that might apply. Um, each case has its own circumstances which need to be weighed. There are certain states that have tort caps. Um, in fact, even I, I believe the Parkland, Florida incident, there was there was some media coverage about that even earlier this week um, in terms of what that school district was legally responsible for. So, you know, last month, Tom, we did talk about the police accountability legislation. Um, I don't have any new updates there. I know Frank was asking uh, about that last month for an update. Um, but what I would say here is that the legislation that was passed in Connecticut some of the, the, the legislation takes effect this coming July of 2021. <clears throat> um, I think that there will continue to be more and more updates from law firms and attorneys on this basis. And then we'll just have to see what happens um, with specific cases here in Connecticut. Thank you. All right. Well, hearing no other questions, uh, Chair, Vice Chair, I'll turn it back to you. Good. Thank you. Frank, you got anything? Go ahead, Greg. Go ahead, Greg. You're All fine. Right. You're, you're here. You're taking over, my friend. All right. If there are no further questions, um, Chris Monroe? Sure. Do you have the floor? Sure. Good evening, everybody. Um, just a couple of things from me tonight. Um, Two are by the way of, of updates. Um, the third is kind of getting into our monthly claim report. And then I just want to make a comment or two in terms of a rollout that's been in the news of late. Um, Connecticut is moving in the direction of a paid family leave program for January 1. And I just want to spend a little bit of time of talk, talking about that program and more importantly, making sure we have a handle on what its impact uh, would be for Weathersfield. Um, by way of update, um, I am ready to launch the renewal process, if you will. Um, typically what I do is I wait until I have claim activity through uh, the month of uh, October. So uh, October, we're still a, a couple weeks away from fish, finishing it up. Um, generally, I'll be in a position to put forth the first pass renewal um, sometime in the middle of November. Um, we generally try to give ourselves a month or two before we get the official response from Blue Cross, um, but I will be starting that process shortly. Um, this is a little bit of a different year. Um, we're in essence continuing um, the renewal efforts or the marketing efforts that we started last year. So as everybody knows, um, this time last year, I was talking about launching, launching a marketing effort for 2020. Um, for all, for a number of obvious reasons, that date has come and gone. 
but we're going to continue moving forward with a renewal offering for 2021. Uh, one that includes responses from the Connecticuters, the Aetnas, the Uniteds, the Blue Crosses of the world. Um, we're going to do it for our active population. We'll do it for our retirees. In looking at it, we'll look at an integrated approach and we'll work, work at a carve out approach on the pharmacy as well. So we're essentially just kind of keeping the train moving um, based upon the efforts that were started last year. So in one hand, I'm going to start the update in November for our renewal. And then at the same token, I'll continue pushing forward on the marketing exercise uh, for next July. Um, any questions for me folks on what I've touched upon on those two topics? Anyone? Yeah, I do. Um, I just am wondering on the, um, I, I, on your, the renewal uh, numbers that you're getting, are you also um, uh, looking at, um, oh, our, our wellness, the cost for uh, instituting a wellness program? Yeah, we, um, we uh, Polly, have that wellness requirement in pretty much all of our union contracts. And yeah. Um, that requirement's pretty straightforward. Um, yeah, but we haven't we haven't started. Um, uh, we haven't we don't use it, or we haven't uh, we don't. implemented it yet. No, nope, so. we don't. We don't. But keep in mind um, a couple things. Um, the hope has always been that we can find that third party, and find and allow that third party to manage the compliance side of it. Okay. Uh, one that keeps the town and the board out of it. Um, that has always been a $25,000, $30,000 investment. Um, two things, we'll certainly look to possibly launching that next year. But keep in mind, folks, part of the um, renewal offer from Blue Cross last year um, as a result of the marketing was access to a wellness fund. So we have a $40,000 wellness fund with Blue Cross. Um, those funds expire at the end of the year, so they don't roll over. And they certainly wouldn't roll over if we end our association with Blue Cross. So we have $40,000 to spend between now and next, uh, the, end of, the end of June 2021. So we can always uh, put it towards uh, that compliance uh, program, Polly. Um, we can put it towards um, any wellness related initiative. So one of the things we're going to have to start wrapping our arms around is, you know, how do we, I don't want to say get rid of that money, but how do we put that money to use in a productive manner uh, from, from a wellness standpoint? And is that um, $40,000, is that, has that only accumulated this year? Yeah, it kicked, prior to this year, I think we, we might've had five, or we had 10,000. Yeah. And, um, and then they, uh, they upped it to 40,000 in response to the, the marketing effort. Oh, okay. And, and keep in mind, Polly, even when we're talking with the Cignas and the Etnas and the United, just like they did this time around, um, we're going to still have access to a comparable amount. Could be 35, could be 45. Um, all those carriers would also provide us with access to a wellness fund um, if we ended our association with Blue Cross. Okay, because what, um, what I also would wonder then would be if it was... Um, say we we were able to afford it this year between the 35 or forty thousand dollars whether it would um you know whether we'd be able to continue it i mean i know we would have made a commitment but how it would impact us budget wise um if we were to continue it if there would be money available um or whether the third is that a cost to the third party um annually or um you know would say it was a twenty five thousand dollar bill do we have to come up with that twenty five thousand every year um, we, we would that's a that's an annual charge okay. but that wellness fund is annual as well so if okay. we say partnered with any one of those other carriers or even blue cross that forty thousand isn't a one-year deal um that's part and parcel with every year in which we stay with them okay. so in theory we've got 40 to pay it to Twenty-five, thirty thousand dollar bill. Um, we'll always have enough money there to pay that bill. Okay. Now, the one thing I would say, and I don't know if this applies to the town and the board, um, and we'd have to check with Blue Cross. You know, you have a lot of carriers that have historically offered wellness funds. Um, there hasn't been a whole lot of wellness work done, especially in a COVID environment. 
So you had a, a lot of these funds just sitting there. Um, these carriers will typically let us um, use a portion of those funds to reimburse ourselves if we had to go and purchase any PP, uh, PPE type equipment. So if the board of that had to go out and buy a thousand masks, if the town had to go out and buy 500 masks, if we spent $2,500 on hand sanitizer, um, it's not uh, out of the realm of possibility that we can use that 40,000 to reimburse ourselves for those expenditures. So, um, you know, just keep that in the back of your mind if, uh, if you have those expenditures out there. Thanks. Sure. Um, as far as the claim report goes, let me see if I can share this screen here. Uh, what am I looking at here? Let me know if my exhibit comes up on the screen. We'll see if this works. Yep, nice yeah. job. All right, so yeah. what this does obviously is it should be familiar. It's the same format we use every month. And folks, we're just trying to count the beans in terms of where we are year to date. Um, you know, one quarter doesn't make a year. Um, when you look at kind of what our expectation is from a budgetary standpoint, you know, based upon the number of enrollees on the plan today, um, we have an annual budget of around $12.3 million. Um, that rolls down, if you will, to about $3.1 million a quarter. Now, when you look at where we are relative to what we budgeted and what's come through, um, we're certainly in uh, very good shape, okay? Um, we're sitting on a nice surplus year to date. Um, keep in mind, and again, um, you generally see surpluses accrue early on. Um, every one of our unions um, has access to a high deductible plan. So keep in mind, those deductibles reset on July 1. So that single person, generally in the first couple of months, is satisfying that $2,000 deductible. Um, that family is satisfying that $4,000 deductible. What you generally see as you get deeper into the plan year, those deductibles are satisfied, and then it just puts more weight back on Weathersfield um, in funding all costs beyond the deductible. So certainly off to a good, good start. Um, the start is influenced in large measure by the fact that it's early in the year. Um, it's also influenced in large measure by the fact that we do have a $470,000 claim adjustment put forth by Anthem. Um, if you remember from the prior month's discussion, um, they had processed the claim, reversed the claim, processed it, reversed it again, all in and around the end of the prior plan year. Um, our argument was, listen, had you processed this in a more timely manner, that claim would have gone against our prior plan year stop loss policy and because you ultimately threw it into the new plan year, um, you put us in a tough spot relative to um, that stop loss deductible of 150. They essentially threw the whole claim into the prior plan year by giving us a dollar for dollar credit on that $471,000. So it's a little artificial, but um, it is an accurate reflection of what happened in the first three months. And we're looking at about a you know, million dollar surplus so far. But again, three months doesn't make a year. So um, cautiously optimistic as we continue to move forward. Um, you know, nothing really, um, you know, large claims are always um, the concern. Um, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, uh, large claims make or break the plan year. Um, when you look at where we are today, um, beyond that one big claim that I already made reference to, you know, we have a couple of people who've jumped up pretty quickly. Um, two people who are in excess of our $150,000 pooling point. And then we have two people who are just over the 50,000. So again, <clears throat> I would still look at this as a favorable start. We don't seem to be getting hit as we had in years past with some real significant flare ups on the large claim side. So, uh, so far, so good when it comes to where we are from a large claim standpoint. 
Um, here is kind of what I like to rely on to keep track of, you know, how are we relative to prior years. Um, this is our large claim history. And I think in a few prior meetings, we had talked about um, where the best, where the tale of two cities, if you will. You know, our old experience, 2014, 15, 16, um, we were a high flyer, good performer from a stop loss, a large claim standpoint. Um, we would see 15, 16, 17 people a year who generated claims over 150. And then the uh, train went off the tracks in 17, 18, and 19, where we saw a dramatic uptick in our large claim activity. Um, we'll see what this year brings, but this is kind of what we're all measuring against, folks. The new normal when it comes to large claims for us seems to be in that 30 to 35 person range. Um, we've got five through the first quarter. Um, you know, does that mean we annualize and think we're going to have 20? I don't think we'll have 20. You know, I'd love to see us come in at 25 or even, you know, low side of 30. But at this point, it just stands to reason um, we're in pretty good shape when it comes to large claims. Um, as much as it's a million dollars, remember 470 of that really should be in this period right here. So again, so far so good when it comes to where we sit from a large claim standpoint. And, uh, but again, the time will tell as to uh, whether the three months is our new normal or it's just an, uh, a blip on the radar screen. But uh, any questions for me folks? Anybody? No, okay. Yeah, the, the other thing I like to look at too is, you know, kind of per capita outlays. Um, this will become important when we get to renewals. Um, all carriers, Blue Cross included, you know, they're gonna come to the table with what they call their book of business trend uh, assumptions. Uh, when you look at what those assumptions are, um, typically what you find is most carriers are generally using eight, nine percent medical trend. Um, you have some elevation on the pharmacy side where it is generally in that 10 to 12 percent range. Um, you know, you take a, a nine and a 12 percent annual trend rate and you compound that over, you know, 16, 17, 18 months, then you're building in a healthy amount of trend. And it tends to inflate um, what you might need from a budgetary standpoint. What we've always done in Weathersfield is we always like to look at how we trend year to year to year. And this gives you a little bit of a feel that we're on somewhat of a roller coaster. When you go back to 2012, we've had some years um, where we've done fabulously well. You know, remember that benchmark is at 8 to 12%. Um, we've had some years where it's been single digits. Uh, we've had years where it was a decrease. Um, we've had years where we got hit pretty hard with a 20% increase, with a 17, 18% increase. But when I look at this over the long haul, we don't trend annually at 10 to 12%. So one of the things we'll do as we get deep into the renewal is we'll look at, all right, Blue Cross is telling us to use 10 to 12% annual. Um, let's go with the impact if we use eight, if we use six, if we use five. Um, that's all uh, sound from an underwriting standpoint because you're basing that over a um, long period of time. And uh, you know, you're making sure you rely on some historical trend numbers. This is where I get those, that guidance from, where you'll see how uh, you know, we typically knock on wood trend um, at a lower rate than the carrier's traditional book of business. Um, last year, down 3%, you know, that's COVID influenced, clearly. You got a couple months that you can argue, argue were somewhat depressed, um, but we're also, again, starting out in a good spot this year. Um, but again, I think it's important to always make sure we keep track of, our, is our trend moving in the right direction or the wrong direction? Okay. Um, here's the ugly report, <clears throat> which I generally don't like to share with a carrier. Ashley, you didn't hear that. Um, this is the, uh, you know, how are we on a stop loss standpoint? 
And, you know, we've had some years where we were great. We've had some years where we were in rough shape. Um, I'll give a shout out to Mike O'Neill. You know, Mike was the guy with CT Prime who negotiated the 0% increase last year from a stop loss standpoint. Um, look at our results for 2019 and 20. Um, for every dollar we gave them, they gave us back that same dollar. You know, you can argue that that $700,000 refund should be $470,000 higher because of the adjustment made. So um, again, additional kudos to Mike um, to, to have this experience and end up with a 0% increase. Um, uh, fabulous result, fabulous result. Um, off to a good start this year. Um, so we'll see, uh, we'll see where it goes from here. Okay. So that's what I had on the uh, da, 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 da. let me get out of here uh, on the monthly claim report. Um, couple comments on paid family leave. Um, Connecticut is not new. Um, paid family leave has started to gather some momentum over the last couple of years. Um, you have some states that actually have leave laws on the books. Um, Massachusetts <coughs> rolled theirs out uh, last year. And Mass is very similar to Connecticut. What Mass said is, all right, this benefit is gonna start 2021, but we're gonna start collecting premium in 2020. So you, the employer, you're gonna give us a one year head start before benefits actually uh, go into effect. So you've gotta pay your premium in advance, all right? Um, but Mass has one and it'll officially launch benefit-wise in a couple of, couple of months. New York has one. Um, Connecticut followed suit. You know, if you look at the states, there's probably 10, 15 states that have um, paid family leave uh, bills pending in state legislators. So it's not going away, it's gonna be here. Um, a couple of comments relative to Connecticut. Um, Connecticut, unlike Massachusetts, where employers in mass have to fund a portion of the cost, Connecticut, the law is driven on the concept of it is employee funded. So there's no financial obligation that comes from the employer. Um, the way they fund it is they're essentially going to take for all folks out there working they're gonna take a half a percent of your pay <clears throat> and your employer is gonna send it to the state pool. Um, that's gonna start this January and the benefits would commence in 2022, okay? So um, regulations are not locked down. Um, guidance is not locked down. It's a very limited amount of information that's been released from the state. In essence, what the message is to employers is you got to get ready to start taking deductions in 2021 with the benefit going live in 2022. The good news is there's no employer cost, it's an employee cost. All right. Um, with that being the case, um, how does that impact Weathersfield? Um, the good news is there's a nice loophole in the law where it does not impact Weathersfield. Um, any state uh, governmental agency, any municip municipal governmental agency, um, any regional uh, board of ed, um, school association, um, we are exempt from Connecticut family leave. So all of that talk of taking deductions does not apply to us, okay? There is one caveat to that, and this will happen. If a union goes to the board or the town and through the bargaining process negotiates in paid family leave, then the door is kicked open and every other union gets it. So if you, Mike, were to pick your smallest union and you were to say, okay, you know, we're going to give it to them. They're paying for it. 
you know, let's throw them a bone and, and, and give them the benefit. Well, guess what? Now the police get it. Now physical services get it. <clears throat> and the same thing applies on your side, man. You know, it's, it's once, once that one entity is in, then the door is kept open for everybody. So um, what that means to you now is really um, go into 2021 with no obligation and you react um, through the bargaining process if a union comes to you and uh, it's for a proposition to, to roll out family leave for them. Um, but that's kind of where we're at. I wish I had more for you, but like I said before, um, there's very limited information that's been released by the state. But uh, what I what has been released um, is what I just articulated back to the group. Okay. Anybody? Thanks. All righty. Um, anything else for Mike? Uh, I'm sorry, for, for Chris? No, Ashley, anything for Ashley? Thank you, Ashley. No, for, for, uh... I'm all set. Thank you. Okay. All righty. Then if there's no other questions, let's move on to other business, of which I have two items. Does anybody else have items before I chip in? We have the date. Yeah. We have the dates that we got to deal with, Frank. Okay. Let's, uh, you want to do that? Why don't we do that now? So does anyone have calendars in front of them? Give you a minute to get your calendars out or just write them down. Uh, who, who said that? Was it Mike, you, Mike, or? No, that was me. That was Greg. But oh. uh, it, it's in the packet, so the dates are all laid out till oh, uh, oh, okay. till okay. next year. So we have them in front right. of us. So we're all we're all yeah, set. Okay. 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 Right. All right. I did not have them in front of me. Um, any questions? Any concerns? Any objections? Any religious holidays and feast days and holy days that we can possibly consider? No? Frank, uh, Did I think? September, Go ahead. September 16th is Yom Kippur. Thank you. September 16th. Okay, right. So we, what do you want to do about that date then? Uh, we, could, that, we could bump it a week. Do you want to do that? Let me yeah, just yeah. Yep, yeah, that's fine. First, we got to get into next year. <laughs> but yes, that's a good, thank you for picking that up. That would be, that would be the 23rd. Okay. Uh, I would call for a motion to vote on the amended agenda per the uh, Yom Kippur for next year. Anybody so second that? So okay. Moved. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Motion carries. We have an agenda for next year. Uh, anything else, Mike, or the uh, the committee? I have two items. No. no. Okay. So uh, I happen to go into the town of Weathersfield site because I was looking for the, I'm on the uh, Veterans Commission as well. And what I find interesting is that we aren't listed under the commissions. The insurance committee is not listed under commissions and committees and boards. Just curious about that. Usually, I mean, you click onto the insurance one, it lists who the members are, are the, uh, the uh, uh, veterans one or any, some of the other committees. Is that something we could put on there, or do we need to put on there? Discussion? Maybe we're a stealth organization. Pardon me? Are we a stealth organization? I don't know that. <laughs> that was a joke, Frank. <laughs> uh, well, okay. okay. I, I, I don't know what question. I mean, is there any good reason why we should or should not be on the, on the Weathersfield uh, website for the insurance committee? We're like the trilateral commission, Frank. Hey, it's so, nice to be working yeah, under the radar, too. Nobody knows who we are. <laughs> the Bilderberg. I'm sensing that everyone would like to, to play uh, under the radar. I, I, it's fine with me. I mean, geez. Hey, um, hey, Frank, uh, this is Chris Wardrop. I just, you know, working virtually, you know, it's amazing how you can just kind of jump onto things. It does, if you do a, a keyword search for <laughs> Tyler Weathersfield Insurance Committee, it looks like there is a link to, uh, I'm looking here, like a 521 insurance committee agenda package. So there yeah, is I saw a, that. 
Yeah, so there's a drop down. So I don't know if there's like broken links or 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 whatnot, but I, I see exactly what you're saying too. Yeah, I mean, and, and I and I saw that. And there's also the agenda for this meeting, but there's no list of committee members who our town council advisor is. Uh, I mean, to my to my mind's eye, you know, why not? But again, I don't have any strong feelings. I just want to get. I'm not going to make a motion on it. I just want to have a discussion on it. It's strange because on the what you do exist as the insurance committee when you look up agendas, it shows yeah. up in the regular calendar as an insurance committee meeting. Yeah. I would like to make a motion that uh, the it's been an oversight. Yes, uh, I would like to make a motion that uh, the logistics to put the names of the insurance committee members on that particular page of the uh, town website. Uh, be done. Any seconds? Any discussion? No, I'll, I'll, I'll second that. That's fine. I'll second it. I, yeah, it's just a little thing. I mean, I know that. Yeah, that's uh, fine. Are... That's fine. Okay. All well, in favor? Uh, yeah, that makes uh, that makes sense if the others are on there. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I, I, I think I think it does. Um, and if there's no further discussion, uh, I'll call for a, a vote of approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Vote. Opposed? No. Mike, how do we make that happen? Uh, I can I can talk to IT and get that done. Okay. Good. Yep. All right. Okay. The other issue is, um, I, and I mentioned this to Mike, uh, I was on the um, Veterans Commission last week, last Wednesday, and we were doing a Zoom. Somehow my computer was able to work then, but not now. Uh, <laughs> it's my laptop, actually. It, you know, it's, it's, a, it's an IBM uh, AT. Um, actually, it's not a laptop. It's a cube. Uh, and all of a sudden, in the in early part of, the, uh, of the, uh, the Zoom, some external individual whose name showed up as Henry started with a litany of curse words and racist comments. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was awful, and we didn't know where it was coming from, but um, uh, the uh, person in charge of that basically muted everyone, muted everyone. We all had to re-sign in again. Now, I would call it a hack because any, uh, it, 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 when it's sent out, it's it sent to, you know, on the town website. Anybody from the general public can participate in that meeting just like this one. And so I just want to mention it because I don't know that there's any way around it, but I think that we should have a protocol that if something like that happens, uh, Mike would immediately uh, mute everyone and then um, somehow uh, terminate with extreme prejudice the offending caller. Any, any thoughts on that? Any discussion yeah, that you makes want to sense. make? I mean, it, it's going on in, you know, across the world in these Zooms now. And they yeah, are being yeah. So... I think that's the protocol, Mike. You can go ahead and just mute everybody, and then we'll just go bye bye, and then come back on. Yeah. If I may, hey, you got something? If, um, yep. So, and Mike, I actually haven't had a chance to catch up with you. I just run into some of your staff, so I am sending out an email to staff. Um, we're going to do like a training uh, with some basic protocols as to how to handle that particular occurrence. Um, what will probably happen in the next, by the next meeting, your sign-ins, we're gonna be a little bit different. We're trying to set it up so that um, you have no ability to unmute yourself um, uh, without permission specifically from whoever's controlling the meeting. Um, there's a couple caveats to that, which I don't wanna go into a lot of detail at this point because it's, it, you know, it's Can almost a trial and error what? thing. What's that? Oh. Hello. Sorry. Um, so just to continue, there will be a protocol. We're creating policies and procedures internally to address that, which will affect Good. members as well as people looking to call into the pub from the public. Um, but we'll okay. a couple of controls. The other thing to please keep in mind, and I, I've, I've mentioned this to a couple other commissions that I've spoken to, if you get a link, a Zoom link invite to a meeting, um, even if you want people to participate as the public or listen in, please do not forward them the link information that we send to you. What we post on the um, agenda 
for um, connection is actually how we want people to log in. We don't want them coming in through a, a video Zoom. We want uh, non, non commission members, I should say, or presenters should be coming in through the phone, through the dial in uh, whenever possible. So we are looking at internal policies and procedures and some control changes that Mike will have. Um, and then also please don't forward the link invite to other individuals. Yeah, makes right. So that was truly a hack then, I suppose, huh? Yeah, I think there was. Yeah, that's what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. What a surprise. It could, much, times. it could have been much worse. Some other communities have had, I mean, I, it was bad. Don't get me wrong. Uh, you know, the types of words that were said are it just, yeah, I don't want to go down that path. Um, but we've, other communities have had the video component as well as those same um, comments. Really? Mm. In, an, in an ordinary- it's Unfortunate. In an ordinary yeah. public meeting, not a Zoom meeting, doesn't the chairperson have authority to have disruptive individuals uh, removed or cut off if, if necessary? Uh, it depends on who's controlling the, uh, the actual uh, Zoom. Yeah, no, I'm just talking uh, about uh, yeah. if generally. We're, if we were not in this situation, if we were just having a, if we were in the uh, committee room and, and someone oh. disrupted the meeting. Oh, I see. Uh -huh. uh, I suspect so. Um, I mean, it would depend on the circumstances, but I suppose I could ask one, uh, an individual to immediately leave yeah. and see where that went. Yeah, the, the difficulty here with the, with the Zoom is you, the way Zoom is set up is if you, you hit mute all um, and that works, but then you have to, depending upon how large of a group, right? So if I'm in, if it's this group now, you have to go back through and individually unclick everyone. You got to be fast on the trigger to hit the mute button. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where you yeah. might be able to during a public meeting, bang a gavel, throw a shoe, do something yeah. else. Um, yeah. You're yeah. in Zoom. It's like, oh my God. Where is it? Um, as someone, by the way, who experienced that during a council meeting. Um, <laughs> nice. Uh, it's Paulie, was that you? Yeah. <laughs> um, but in that, you know, and not to go off the rail, but that was an unfortunate event because so many people were on the call. Um, I hid anyone who, um, and, and this might be a thing that happens in the future too, if you have a public meeting. Um, if you have a lot of people calling, you actually hide the people who are on, on video so that more people can be on the screen when you're videotaping it because it's going out to the public. And that those cases, you have to bring all the people back on, then scroll through and find the person who's speaking uh, to be able to kick them off. So it's um, it's not unfortunate. It's not something we can do quickly. Um, and of course, everyone has that initial shock as to, oh my God, what is going on? Yeah. So you got to have quick reaction time. Well, we're aware now, so uh, hopefully that we can uh, deter that. I just, uh, it was very interesting to have that for the first time. It was really shocking. But, I forgot you were on the commission. Oh. <laughs> they forget it's the Veterans Commission, too. So. Maybe we should stay oh. on the radar, Frank. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that. Yeah, I know. Well, fine, a good argument here, Frank. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, something about fine stealth. Okay, if there's no further uh, uh, open discussion, I will entertain a motion to adjourn uh, the meeting. So and make that motion. Second. Next second. All in favor? Aye. 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 See you next month. Stay Thank safe. you all, guys. Thanks, everybody. Take care, everybody. Don't forget to vote. Molly, yeah, Diane yeah, said to say oh, hi. Huh? Diane hi. said to say hi. Oh, good. Molly. All right. Tell her I said hi, too. Take care, everyone. Good night.